So uh, I'm going to talk today about Boko Haram. Um, it was the press who, um, um, uh, my, my idea for the title of that book was actually the archeology span of Boko Haram. And uh, Oxford said, no, no, nobody will go for that. So I wasn't allowed to uh, use the title that I wanted to for the book. But um, what I want to talk about today then is uh, some aspects of Boko Haram that I think are distinctive and worth pondering. Um, before I get into it, the one thing I want to note is that I'm not going to, tr um, I'm not going to claim that I'm giving a complete picture of Boko Haram here. There's, Boko Haram is in some ways one of the most controversial of terrorist organizations or insurgencies in Africa and has been for the last 10 years. And this has had to do with uh, controversies over its, um, its local roots versus its international connections. Uh, the, the, the impulses that drove the insurgency, whether they were strictly religious or whether they involved economic deprivation, political connections, a whole variety of different issues. There's been a great deal of ink spilled on what really is Boko Haram. And I think that um, my own take on it is that this um, insurgency, like others, is multifarious. It has different aspects. And what I, what I want to talk about particularly is the aspect of its history, how it's rooted in history. Because of course, even if we think about it as a, 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 a terrorist organization with international connections today, we have, to, we have to realize that it is understood both by the insurgents themselves and by their victims and their adversaries in a historical context. And so I want to place some of this in a historical context. That's one reason for the talk that I'm going to give. The other reason is, you know, as, as, as Carlos noted, um, uh, my own experience in this area, uh, and particularly my experience of this area as a borderland. I've, I worked on the prehistory of the Wandala state, which is one of the, the pre-colonial states in this area, and which was divided by the, the originally German French, later British French border between uh, uh, Cameroon and Nigeria, uh, such that I was always working in border areas and with, uh, with an experience of the sorts of violence and opportunities that exist in border areas. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to share the screen and just, I'm going to talk with images if you like. Um, uh, and uh, by if, if either if people have questions or if there's particularly if there's any problems with the images, you know, that I can't see, uh, please do, uh, uh, please do let me know. So let me bring this up. Um, so I think everybody should be able to see this at this point. So let me, let me plunge right into it. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about pasts. I'm an archeologist and I don't have any particular um, uh, insights into the future uh, more than, more than other people have, but um, mm -hmm. Um, okay, let me see. The next thing is, the first thing here is going to be how I can actually advance this. There we go. Okay. Uh, the area that we're speaking about, uh, as has been identified, the, the, the Lake Chad Basin broadly defined. Uh, this is the, um, for me, primarily northern Cameroon and uh, northeastern Nigeria, uh, but it also takes in parts of Niger and Chad as well. We all know of Boko Haram. I put this image in just to indicate that um, much of this conflict has, of course, fallen off the radar with the events of the last two years with COVID, all of the disruptions associated with it, different things happening to different parts of the world. But to indicate that, um, that the, the, the conflict is still very much alive, and this is the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations there, uh, uh, security tracker that that and this is particularly for Boko Haram. Um, you know, one thing you'll see is a spike, for example, in early 2020, uh, a decrease in late 2021. But this is uh, uh, both a conflict that has led to a very large number of deaths and that has uh, extended over a long period of time at this point. Um, and the the different breakdowns of uh, of uh, victims. Uh, civilian victims, um, uh, primarily security forces associated with Nigeria, but not exclusively in Boko Haram itself. Again, continuing over time. 
somewhat older, but the I want to emphasize the degree of the degree of human suffering that this has caused with uh, issues of forced displacement, starvation, uh, abuse of uh, people in various situations. Uh, uh, the Boko Haram conflict has been a, a human tragedy for uh, for people all over this area, and as we're going to see, has extended. Uh, into uh, wider regions as well. My own work um, has concentrated on the area that's shown up on this image in uh, northern Cameroon and northeastern Nigeria. And this shows very approximately the extent of the pre-colonial Wandala state. And I've been interested, my, my, my interests have been, and you'll see the, again, the echoes of this through the talk, my interests have pr primarily been the experiences of people, uh, both prehistorically and historically, people living on the margins of states in this area. I'm interested in the experiences of people on the peripheries looking into state centers and understanding what states, what states mean. In this area, uh, uh, what, that, uh, what that implicates is the experience of enslavement and the process of slave trades in the region over the last thousand years at least. Uh, and echoes of that in a whole variety of different ways. Um, to um, just to, you know, to indicate here, um, why is an archaeologist talking about Boko Haram? Um, the, 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 the pin on this map shows the area where I was most recently working in uh, uh, northern Cameroon on a set of archaeological sites called the DGP sites. Up at the top of the map is my Duggery, which is the urban center. I'll emphasize the urban center from which uh, Boko Haram originated as a religious movement uh, in the early mid 2000s. In the middle is the Sambisa Forest Reserve, which is, still continues to be one of the refuges of Boko Haram. And, uh, and in the Southwest, Chibok, uh, which is the, 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 the town from which uh, schoolgirls were kidnapped in this, in this famous mass kidnapping of young women uh, about 10 years ago by Boko Haram. So this, this is very much uh, the scale down at the bottom, bottom right uh, near Marrow is 10 kilometers. So you'll see that this, uh, th th this has been an experience for me uh, involving uh, the areas I work in, the areas I've lived. I started working in this area in 1984, I will note. So I've been working there for quite some time. Just to note, this is DGB1. This is uh, the largest of the sites that we were working on in uh, Northern Cameroon uh, through the late uh, 2000s and early 2010s. If uh, you'll see on this image again, uh, the scale in that case uh, down in the lower right is two kilometers. Uh, and you'll see the proximity of the DGB sites where we were working uh, in uh, the period 2011, 2012, 2013 to a uh, Boko Haram presence across the border in the mountains in northeastern Nigeria at the same time, 10 kilometers or, uh, or less away at times. I will note the Gwoza, uh, the town indicated under Boko Haram control, and that actually was... Uh, designated by Boko Haram as the capital of the caliphate in 2013-2014 was also the area I used as a base of operations when I was working in on Mwandala prehistory in northern Nigeria. Now, this is an area that's, as I said, uh, uh, you know, people in here are often people I know. Uh, this is a picture taken from one of the DGB sites in, uh, I think, uh, 2012, looking across into Nigeria. The hills in the distance there in Nigeria were occupied by, by Boko Haram at the time. Again, just an, another indication, uh, uh, an image, and I want to come back to, to something of this uh, image. It's not a very good Landsat. It's an old Landsat image in many ways. It shows bo both archaeological sites that we've worked on on both sides of the border, the Red Stars in Cameroon and Nigeria, the DGB sites in purple, and uh, areas of significant Boko Haram activity in the period between about uh, uh, 2013 and uh, 2017, 2018. I will note that there's still Boko Haram activity going on in this area, uh, much more sporadic at this point. As I'll note, the, the center of gravity of Boko Haram is, has moved somewhat, but uh, this, is, this has been an area of quite active 
spoke over RAM activity for some time. And as we'll see, one question is what exactly does that mean? I will, I'm, I'm going back to Carlos's work here as well, because this is very much about echoes of, of the past and the present. Uh, one of the echoes that uh, the, the, the extraordinary uh, work that Car Carlos and his colleagues did at uh, sites like Zelum in northern, uh, uh, northern Nigeria uh, uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, you know, the indication of these, uh, of these uh, protected sites, large concentrated protective sites surrounded by ditches in this area. Um, and I think it's, and this, this idea of ditched and walled towns has, 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 has a lot of political importance and political impact in, um, uh, in, in this area. And when we think about the development of state level societies and their, and their relations with other communities in this area over the last 2,500 years. And what, what I'd note is that uh, one, of the, one of the tactics that governments have used to uh, combat Boko Haram uh, uh, over the last 10 years has actually been, again, to, to, to go back to the old practice, the 2,500 year old practice in this region of surrounding, uh, of surrounding communities with ditches and walls. Here we have Kolofata, uh, satellite image of Kolofata in uh, northern, uh, uh, northern Cameroon. And uh, you can, uh, I think you can probably follow my pointer as you look, but you can see the the, the, the major ditch system that was built, a uh, ditch and wall system that was excavated with bulldozers around Kolofata to uh, channel uh, Boko Haram suicide bombers. So we have again, images on, from, again, from uh, Carlos's work at Zilam uh, with uh, uh, the outline of one of these uh, ditches in a pit at Zilam and an image from Kolofata from the ditch and wall system at Kolofata uh, just a few years ago. So I think it's, it's extraordinarily ironic that these communities have become walled communities again, uh, as, they have been, uh, uh, as they have been for uh, uh, significant periods over the last 25 centuries. So I, as I said, I want, I want to talk about how we understand Boko Haram. And again, to emphasize that this is not an exclusive understanding, that this is one aspect that I think is an interesting and important aspect of, of, of the existence and functioning of Boko Haram, but it's certainly not the only way of thinking of them. And I would never make that claim. The first thing to note, of course, is I am an archeologist. And the, the, what, whereas there are multiple factors and influences in the ways we might think about Boko Haram, I tend to think about them in part in terms of landscapes and the ways in which people have used landscapes in this area uh, over, uh, over the millennia. This is uh, my, in some ways, one of the things I've been really interested in in Northern Cameroon has, has been the degree to which we could think of human landscapes of enslavement, of slave raiding, um, and how the, 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 the process of slave raiding has, has changed the landscape and changed the affordances, if you like, of the landscape in this area through time. And so there's the first thing I want to do is talk briefly about a couple of different aspects of the landscape that uh, in areas, in two areas where Boko Haram has been uh, particularly active and has been able to persist over time. Persistence is, is important. Um, uh, Boko Haram, as I said, began as an urban phenomenon, but was relatively, um, uh, after 2009, was relatively quickly eliminated as an urban phenomenon in Maiduguri uh, and, and uh, neighboring large cities in, um, in northeastern uh, uh, Nigeria. And the question then has become, you know, what are, what are the, some of the aspects of the landscapes where it has persisted uh, since then? I will note as well that when I talk about Boko Haram, I'm also going to be talking about, Boko Haram has been subject to a whole variety of fissions, fusions, factions over time. And uh, there is a whole, um, there's a whole literature on the uh, uh, relationship between Boko Haram, Al Ansaru, uh, the Islamic State West African province. And I'm not really going to get into that here because whereas these, these um, uh, these questions are significant. I think that the overall historical trends hold broadly across the area. 
The first thing I want to note then is I want to talk about two areas where, as I said, Boko Haram in some form has, uh, has been persistent, has been able to, uh, uh, has been able to uh, uh, last through periods of, of significant state reaction. The first of these is actually where I work in this area on the borderlands of uh, Northern Cameroon and Northern Nigeria, and particularly in and around the Northern Mandara Mountains, which is a phrase I have, the Northern Mandara Mountains is a phrase I have repeated so many times in my academic career, I'll never be able to, never be able to count. I showed you this image before indicating both archeological sites in red and, and uh, purple and uh, areas of significant Boko Haram uh, conflict and attacks. So um, uh, the landscape uh, is one that, uh, that I find uh, extraordinary uh, uh, in, its, in its beauty and in, its, in, in the human intervention in this landscape in, in the, the, the ways in which the landscape has been tr transformed by people into a, a real anthropic, intensely inhabited place. Uh, one of the things to note is that historically, the, the, the sort of yellow color here indicates uh, the extent of the mountains themselves. Uh, the Northern Mandara Mountains are uh, extraordinarily diverse ethnically and in terms of social identifications, uh, really quite extraordinarily with the scale down at the lower right there as 10 kilometers. Uh, I, I did most of my PhD work in, eth in uh, ethno-archaeological work in one of the northeastern groups, the Plata, one of the smallest populations and, uh, and their neighbors. This shows both sides of the border with Nigeria on the, it's, it's broadly, um, broadly the same as this uh, image here, uh, Nigeria to the, to the west and, uh, and uh, Cameroon to the east. In this area, the, the, the mountains are occupied uh, historically by uh, non-centralized, non-Muslim, um, uh, intensive farming communities, uh, primarily chaddock speaking communities of, of different sorts. And, um, and, and so uh, very close connections, uh, cultural connections, social connections uh, to, uh, to the particular landscape. This is something that uh, when I started working there in the early 1980s was really difficult to grasp for me. The fact that I could be standing um, in Plata ter ter territory uh, in a situation like that and have uh, within this proximity the, the territories of uh, two other ethnic groups speaking different languages, uh, all Chadic languages, but quite distinct in terms of social and cultural identities. And um, uh, this has been one of the one of the topics that I've been looking at through my career has been how this how this developed over time and how it took place in in the context of a large contrast between these mountain populations and uh, plains populations nearby. I'll come to that in a second. With the plains populations around them, uh, Fulani. Kanuri, Shwa Arab, uh, uh, very different sorts of groups living on the plains around the Mandara Mountains. Uh, uh, Boko Haram itself is um, originally, and to a significant extent, even recently, uh, a Kanuri uh, social and movement, a Kanuri insurgency, uh, for reasons that are that are quite complex. And uh, the, the, so the plains around the Mandara Mountains, very different uh, landscapes, both topographically and culturally as well. In this case, the, the plains around the Mandara Mountains as um, areas of um, uh, historically, since at least in this immediate area around the Mandara Mountains, since at least the 16th century, uh, centralized Islamic uh, states. And the distinction between uh, uh, the slave raiding plains populations and populations who were raided for slaves up in the Mandara Mountains is one of the central cultural and historical facts of this area. One of the things that Boko Haram did and has done is do what the, uh, the targets of slave raids did in the, uh, the pre-colonial and early colonial period, that is retreat up into the mountains. These mountains, I'll just, 
are good places for defense. And so the, it's the, again, the affordances of the landscapes are one of the things that have allowed uh, this insurgency to persist in and uh, around the Mandurah Mountains since that time. The affordances of both the landscape and the, and the, and the frontier, the international frontier. Uh, are both elements that have um, that have really made uh, it possible for uh, Boko Haram to exist there, but we see here, uh, you know, this is not simply a um, um, some sort of unmitigated throwback to the pre-colonial past. Uh, you know, one thing you'll notice, I said, Boko Haram are primarily uh, significantly associated with Kanuri populations. Uh, the Kanuri people were uh, in pre-colonial period the slave raiding Muslim populations on the plains. And in, of course, uh, Boko Haram is seen as, uh, as in some ways, some, some variety of fundamentalist Islamist movement. So uh, to have those people using the, the potentialities, the defensive potentialities of the Mandarin Mountains uh, is in a sense, uh, the reverse of the, um, uh, of the pre-colonial uh, process. Uh, the, the, the protectiveness is the same, but the identities of, of who, who is the state and who is not are quite different. I will also note that one thing that's happened here is that some of the, some of the um, mountain populations, again, historically, uh, people who have been uh, resistant to Kanuri and other slave raiding have actually uh, converted to Islam and joined uh, Boko Haram in significant numbers. This is best known in population you'll see up on the, the sort of uh, uh, left-hand side of this image, a population of people uh, in Nigeria called Guduf, who went through a large-scale uh, process of conversion to quite a, quite a strict form of Islam in the uh, uh, early 2000s, and um, a number of whose members have joined Boko Haram. So there are historical resonances here, but as I said, we do not think about these things as simply um, unmitigated images of what was going on in the past. People are using the landscape in similar ways, but the identifications of the people who are doing it are sometimes very, very different indeed. The second area where, where this has certainly been the case is Lake Chad itself. And here you have the lake, this highly variable shallow lake, which, which changes in extent significantly over very short periods of time uh, that is, uh, sits at the uh, frontier of four different countries with all of the, again, the potentials that that means. And that has, um, its, its variability has served almost as a, a sort of historical bellows over quite short time periods because the different populations in this uh, living around the lake who have historically worked variably as, as fishing people, tradesmen, cattle pastoralists, farmers um, are, are very much um, adapting to the uh, variable extent of, of, of this lake over periods of years and uh, and decades. So this, this lake itself then has become, again, you can see the, the, the variability in the size of the lake to 2007. It's gotten bigger since then, but I, I, I thought that this would just indicate the, the striking uh, ways in which uh, lake, Chad, lake Chad changes over time. And um, this is from uh, uh, one, one of the, the texts on Boko Haram, uh, which, which, which talks about the, the Lake Chad as a cosmopolitan space, which it entirely is and has been for a very long period of time uh, for, for many centuries. It's a space of, um, of refuge, again, uh, the islands and marshes around the lake itself. It's a space of encounter between different populations. It's a place for trading and so on. And it's not, it's entirely unsurprising at that, at this point that it has now become one of the epicenters of uh, control for groups affiliated with Boko Haram, particularly Islamic State West Africa province. So again, the, the, the characteristics of this lake, a place of encounter, a place of great variability, a place of refuge, uh, uh, like the, it's a, it's an, in in a sense the polar opposite topographically to the mountains where mostly I've worked, but in the sorts of affordances it 
uh, uh, it provides to populations who are um, in conflict with or seeking a refuge from centralized government, it does the same thing. It's played this role certainly in the government in the governance of of all four countries around the lake uh, since well before Boko Haram. It's been a uh, uh, a refuge for dissenting groups from all four countries, uh, you know, since the since the colonial period. So I want to move now from talking about frontier, uh, sorry, from talking about landscapes in general to a more specific question that I think is significant to thinking historically about Boko Haram, and that's the the idea of Boko Haram as a frontier phenomenon. And I think that. I think that this is something that um, did not originally get enough attention. Uh, and it, what got me thinking about it was, was just the accounts of Boko Haram that I was hearing um, in, the, um, in the late 19, uh, late uh, 2000s, which, you know, I, I, had this, I had this question about why is it that a, an essentially urban um, insurgency it begins in, in my degree, that begins in a city of millions of people. Why does it keep ending up in borderlands? What is it about these borders that, uh, that, that are so interesting? The other thing was just my own experience in those same borderlands of, of who was using those borderlands and what were they using them for? One of the characteristics of frontiers in many parts of the world is that they're uh, simultaneously places of violence and wealth creation. They're places where poor people can become rich and rich people can become even richer. And, um, and the, the, again, the, the, the history of frontiers in this area is one that is um, complex and that I think informs in many ways the ways we think about Boko Haram. And I want to identify two particular aspects of that. The first involves slave raiding, which I've already mentioned. Slave raiding is very much a frontier phenomenon. It's a phenomenon. If you start, if you if you're a ruler who starts raiding in your own capital, uh, your your rule is probably going to be abbreviated fairly quickly. Slave raiding is something to, you do. There's there, there's a there's a paradox in slave raiding because. Slave raiding in many parts of the world is something you do with to, to marginal communities. It's something that happens to communities who you don't identify as yourself, but communities that you have access to. So the, the, the slave raiding is happening happens in in areas that you don't you don't want to identify them as part of your own state because that might mean that those people had rights to, 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 to your relationships in some ways, but you want, you need access. And so we see this, we, we see this, um, this, uh, um, this combination of, of, of complex relationships around slave raiding in this area. And th th this was something that my, 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 my first published paper in the Journal of African History in 1993, was called Selling the Iron for Their Shackles. And uh, the title came from something, an old, uh, old man, Plasha man from uh, a mountain community said about the Wandala, this pre-colonial state. He said, yeah, those Wandala were very, very clever people. They came here and we traded with them. Uh, they sold us salt and we sold them the iron for our shackles, which is, you know, uh, uh, a weighty, observation. And so this, this question of slave raiding and, and, the, and the frontier characteristics of slave raiding is something that in this area, it got a very long history. Uh, one of the earliest references to the kingdom of Canaan uh, it involves slave raids, quite apart from any wars. They sell Black people for no reason and quite apart from any wars. Uh, the, the slave raiding in this area in the Lake Chad Basin has been the you know, uh, uh, a pursuit of kings, if you like, uh, for uh, significantly over a thousand years. 
taking this from, from an image in a book that uh, the Detlef Groneborn uh, did on an extraordinary archaeological site called uh, Derby Takushe um, at, at Mainz. And what I want to note here, I just put this image in because it gives, an, it gives a sense of the connections uh, associated with the, the slave uh, trading networks in this area. The way I've looked at this over time is that um, what um, in, ex in exchange for uh, the, the, the trade of slaves, enslaved people from the Lake Chad base, Basin north to um, the Mediterranean coast, that what was being exchanged in some ways was stateliness. The, 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 the material appurtenances, if you like, of, of uh, Islamic Orthodox stateliness um, to rulers in the Lake Chad Basin itself. Firearms, chainmail armor, silk clothes, the sorts of things that allowed you to represent, a ruler to represent themselves in this area as cosmopolitan and connected to the wider world. As I said, though, what we see in this area is that, and this, this, um, is, this concept is, uh, uh, I originally read in uh, Stephen Reyna's book, Wars Without End on the Begirmi State in this area, which made this, um, distinction between the different cores, uh, di di sorry, different uh, uh, zones of states uh, in at least the Lake Chad Basin, but it works in other parts of the world as well. A state core that's under full day-to-day -day control of the state center of the ruler and the, and the court and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the structures of the state. A tributary zone that's in, that's, that has recognized relationships of dominance and submission to the central uh, state core and a predation zone, which is accessible to the state, but not fully, not part of the state within which slave raiding takes place. The thing to note is that in many cases, um, these state cores can be quite small. And this is from Reina's book, again, shows the Begirmi state with uh, the core area, and you can see how small it is, Lake Chad, uh, southeast of Lake Chad, the area that uh, Boko Haram works in to the, to the west, to the left in, in, in this image, but um, shows you just how much in this area is part of frontier zones. If you think about the, 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 the predation zone, the zone of predation here as the area where slave raiding is taking place, it's a big area. And in fact, the, 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 the state cores in many of the areas that I work in are even smaller than this. In many ways, I don't think the state core for Wandala was more than about 25 kilometers wide. You can see it, uh, if we take a look at, for example, the development of, of states in this area, the Sokoto Caliphate, for example, in the, in the 19th century, we see similar things going on, particularly in the Western and Southwestern parts uh, so east, sorry, eastern and southeastern parts of the Sokoto Caliphate, massive amounts of slave raiding going on on the state frontiers. In the area of the Mandara Mountains where I work and where Boko Haram uh, uh, has used as a refuge over time, similar kinds of uh, slave raiding uh, for at least the last 500 years. And much of my own interest, my, much of my own archaeological work has been on the origins of this relationship between a slave raiding Wandala state, Wandala and Mandar are the same, the same term, and, uh, and the, uh, the, the target populations in the Mandara mountains. If I go back and look at this, I've shown you this image before, and one of the, one of the things I want to note here, uh, I'm, I'm not making this, uh, this connection randomly. One of the historical um, accidents of, of this area, if you like, is that in the western part of this zone, at a town that you can see on that map in modern Ni Nigeria called Madagali, we have, by an accident of fate, the diary of the last great slave raider in uh, this part of Central Africa. And um, uh, I th the subtitle of this book, uh, The Diary of Hamanyaji, the Chronicle of a West African Muslim Ruler, this guy was a thug. Um, he, um, he was a, a Fulani uh, uh, local ruler in Madagali on the western edge of the Mandara Mountains in uh, modern Nigeria. He raided for slaves between approximately uh, 1908 and uh, um, 1921. He took, he took uh, 
advantage of the of the of the the dislocations associated with World War One in this area. Of course, uh, uh, Germany was fighting uh, Britain and France precisely in this border area. Took advantage of that and uh, was engaged in very large, there's Madagali in that area that I showed you again, uh, sort of in the, in the territory of Boko Haram, if you like. Uh, th this image from uh, one of Nick David's publications shows the area, uh, again, uh, Madagali uh, top center, shows the area of Hamanyaji's raids uh, in the, you know, a century ago, a hundred years ago. And, um, uh, Large-scale slave raiding, uh, uh, thousands of people killed, thousands of people uh, enslaved. Uh, uh, extraordinarily uh, disruptive uh, slave raids. One of the reasons that this is particularly um, uh, striking for me is that one of the local terms uh, in this area, in MAFA, for slave raiders is taken from his name, Hamanyaji. Slave raiders are called Hamaji. Today, Boko Haram are called Hamaji. And the, the, one of the local understandings of Boko Haram, people have an excellent sense of what Boko Haram is. They're, 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 well, uh, they're very well informed indeed. Uh, one of the local understandings of Boko Haram is that they are slave raiders. So again, this idea, slave raiding is something you do on the borders, which exactly, is exactly how Hamanyaji was doing it something you do in the borders. It's something you do, um, uh, a way of making melt, uh, wealth uh, on the borders. And uh, this is the way that local people understand Boko Haram. Of course, you remember one of the, one of the things, of, one of the sh shocking, horrific aspects of, of the kidnapping of the schoolgirls from Chibok, uh, a little bit to the Southwest from that map I just showed you was the head of Boko Haram, Abubakar Shakao uh, proclaiming uh, at the time that this video was taken of these girls sort of dressed in, forcibly dressed in uh, uh, Islamic women's clothing, um, we'll sell these girls in the marketplace. There's no marketplace. Interestingly enough, there was no marketplace when, when Hamanyaji was selling the, the, the British and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Germans had already closed down the slave markets in the area. Haman Yaji essentially was using the, the young women that he enslaved, the primary targets of the slave raids, as uh, sexual slaves uh, to keep his men uh, uh, loyal. And that is one of the ways in which Boko Haram has used them as well. So the, the resonances continue. The second thing, and, and again, uh, another form of frontier wealth creation, different form, banditry and smuggling. This is something that's well attested historically. It's also totally, totally obvious if you're in this area, if you spend any time in the borderlands between Cameroon and Nigeria. One, one aspect of it, Nigeria, uh, historically as a, as a member of OPEC, subsidizing dramatically the price of gasoline. What that led to, of course, was large scale gasoline smuggling across the border into Cameroon. Um, the young men who do this, the nickname for them in Northern Cameroon is Cascadeur, uh, acrobats. Tremendously dangerous, difficult way to make money for impoverished, uh, marginalized young men. You would get convoys of dozens of, of these young men, uh, plastic jerry cans filled with gasoline on motorcycles, uh, driving into the provincial capital uh, of north, uh, extreme north in Cameroon. One of the things we see is that if we look at smuggling, at maps of smuggling routes, and these smuggling routes are extremely well known in this area. I mean, uh, one aspect of this is the, uh, the involvement of elites in smuggling, which, which is massive throughout the area. Uh, smuggling routes are very, very well known. Um, uh, what's significant though, is if you take a look at that map and then you, um, you compare it, another map of smuggling uh, uh, through the area. Um, you compare it to the maps that I showed you where uh, Boko Haram attacks were carrying on. These are the same epicenters of violence. Uh, smuggling continues. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, 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 the smuggled gasoline that was fueling much of Northern Cameroon through most of the time that I've been there, Zwaza, um, 
it hasn't gone away, even though the frontier is supposed to be um, closed because of terrorism. Um, the, the, the gasoline continues to flow across the, across the border, um, which speaks to the, the understandings that local elites have with Boko Haram. Because as I said, these frontier areas are not only places where poor people can get rich, but they're also places where rich people can get even richer. And the, 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 the transfigure, the, 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 the transmogrification of these, of these desperate young men into Boko Haram fighters using motorcycles in the same way has been fairly, fairly obvious. In the same way around Lake Chad itself, which was another uh, smuggling epicenter, obviously, because it's, 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 a, it's a poorly patrolled lake. Um, and this is the area that has now become the, uh, the, the most of the continued, the, the continuing conflict associated with Boko Haram is, uh, and Islamic State West Africa province is actually around the lake itself. And areas around this lake have now become de facto independent of the control of the national governments in the area. And they're essentially run as fiefdoms of ISWAP, um, using, often using the, the proceeds of smuggling associated with um, uh, you know, dried fish, uh, small arms, again, gasoline, a whole variety of different kinds of products. One of the things that, as, a, as an aside, has, as an anthropologist has really interested me over time has been the domestic economy of Boko Haram is that is, how does Boko Haram live? They're, they're meant to be out in the bush, the Sambisa Forest, forest Reserve, the, um, uh, the, the slopes of the Mandarin Mountains, but how do they actually live there? And so, um, and we, we've seen some, some really interesting um, indications of the, of the normalization of Boko Haram through time. And, and this is a, from, a, from the uh, uh, work by a, a reporter for, I think, um, Le Monde, uh, I, I think um, a Francophone reporter uh, writing about the cross-border um, economy of Boko Haram between Cameroon and Nigeria and, uh, and uh, the sort of import-export uh, activities of Boko Haram. And, um, what I want to note here particularly is this term Boko Haram's wives. There's a whole aspect of the of the, the gendered nature of Boko Haram that uh, uh, American uh, anthropologist come geographer named Hillary Matfess has looked at uh, particularly that is really quite significant. But you know, in general, uh, this is a picture that um, was taken, uh, the Nigerian uh, military intercepted and, and killed two uh, Boko Haram militants uh, in northeastern Nigeria about uh, four years ago now. And, you know, what I wanted to note here was not only the two Kalashnikovs off to one side, but what looks like uh, the, uh, the proceeds of a, a local trip to market, uh, which is what they were moving around with them, soap, uh, plastic sandals, uh, sugar, Maggi cubes, uh, rice, you know, it, it's, it's, it was a market run. And so this question of, of, I think, and I think it's significant for thinking about the future of Boko Haram, which is what is the domestic relationship? What are the domestic structures of Boko Haram? And there's been relatively little sense of that, certainly not none whatsoever in the media in which they're supposed to be just hanging out in the bush, basically like phantoms. How do they, how do they, how do they go to market? How does Boko Haram go to market? They walk into a market like this, I presume. Um, and I think that this is uh, a question that, that even today re requires further thought. And, you know, smuggled gasoline, for example, as I said, which still continues to be smuggled across a border that's in theory uh, closed by, uh, by anti-terrorist uh, operations. The past, you know, possible futures. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a. Uh, uh, I, I don't predict the future. I can barely predict predict the past. But um, the, the a couple of things I notice possibilities, and we're seeing these now. And this is something I've been, you know, writing about in the past. But but the question of wider regional engagements, and indeed that's what we've seen of, of course across the Sahel 
over the last uh, five years, essentially. And what drives me crazy is maps like this. Um, and, you know, what maps like this, and they're very influential, at least in, the, in uh, uh, defense circles in the United States, uh, in a lot of Western countries, maps that show sort of, these are supposed to be nicely demarcated terrorist organizations that have these regional attacks. And what you do in, in, order, to, in, in order to combat them is you combat the regional attacks. But, um, uh, you know, what we've seen certainly in, um, in the Lake Chad Basin area is that it's really difficult to tell what are the identities of these people? What are the, what are the motivations that they uh, are undertaking? Is this religion? Is it ethnic motivations? You know, Kanuri yearning to be slave raiders again. To what extent are, are local elites, including government officials, associated with these, uh, with, with these forms of violence? Um, to what extent is this banditry? Uh, what, what sorts of motivations of banditry of profit making? One of the characteristics of Boko Haram insurgents have generally that for the local area, they've been pretty well paid and they have access to young women. Uh, what, what roles do those, do those uh, elements play? What roles do ethnic tensions between groups play? Uh, and so that we, uh, we see maps like this that are really radical oversimplifications of what's going on in any one particular area. Uh, in, in across West Africa now, the, 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 the intersection of political extremism, insurgency, um, banditry, ethnic tensions, is, is fueling a set of conflicts that cannot be fully explained by any one of those different elements. And that's the case in the Lake Chad Basin as well. And what I, one thing I'd note here is just that in this area, um, these forms of border violence are not new. These did not begin with Boko Haram. In fact, they didn't begin really with what we would identify as necessarily political violence at all. Refugees, re, tens of thousands of refugees from banditry. The, 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 the forms of random political violence that Western countries have, have found it pretty easy to ignore in these areas for, uh, for decades. Uh, 100,000 people in the frontier zones between Cameroon and the Central African Republic in the early 2000s. I was, I was doing archaeology working for Exxon on the uh, uh, Chad Cameroon oil pipeline in the early 2000s. I had to have at least a half a dozen bodyguards when I was out doing survey work in uh, Southern Chad. These are just two of them, but um, uh, the levels of violence in that area were very, was very, very high indeed. But Exxon thought it worthwhile in order to extract oil from the area. Uh, an image like this just uh, there's not you know what I, th I think it indicates it's 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 somewhat out of date now it's seven or eight years old but what I think it indicates is just the confluence of different forms of um, uh, of, of violence and different actors uh, countries like uh, Central African Republic that have been unstable over very long periods of time high levels of banditry and certainly we know people moving around associated with Boko Haram. Uh, on the one hand, found in Western uh, Central African Republic, we know those uh, because they involve specific people that those sort of interactions are taking place. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, historically uh, members of uh, Lord, the Lord's Resistance Army, Joseph Kony's group from the 2000s, showing up in the Eastern part of the Central African Republic, originally coming from Uganda. Uh, the regionalization of these conflicts and the, uh, the, the the opportunities for advancement for young men with guns are almost, um, uh, you know, they're impossible to ignore over this area as a whole. Uh, give you see the Central African Republic now, January 2022. This is actually a, a fairly accurate map. The various different groups that are associated with the government forces, government support forces uh, supported now by Russian private military countries, companies. So among the young men with guns now seeking their fortune in this part of the world are, are Russian uh, mercenaries uh, and all of the different groups, including over in the right hand, still uh, <laughs> an area that's a tiny little area to some degree controlled by the couple of hundred people who still exist with Lord's Resistance Army. Um, 
become continental networks of, of conflict, and they will continue to be so. Um, um, this is, a, in many ways, uh, an awful image. Um, the, the young women, many of them the Chibok schoolgirls, many of them were coerced in some way into becoming suicide bombers in, north, in northern Nigeria, northern Cameroon, in uh, um, the period between about 2014 and 2017. This shows uh, uh, one of the suicide belts, and this was a um, this was a fairly uh, common uh, form of suicide belt being used. These are munitions from French-made Beluga cluster bombs, uh, airdrop cluster bombs, uh, that in some way Boko Haram uh, uh, obtained a fairly large number of these. Nobody knows how, and repurposed them. They're bomblets. Uh, repurposed them into uh, into uh, suicide vests. Uh, if you want to. If you want a horrific uh, metaphor for globalization, uh, there it is right there. Um, the, the last thing was, I, 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 was, I was sort of being, uh, I had somebody um, uh, at a talk I was giving on this at one point uh, and who was being a bit of a smart ass about things and asked me, you know, well, what would be the most surprising thing I'd say about Boko Haram? And I said, one, one of the things is we might see Boko Haram turning into something that, are, having some sort of social identity or ethnic identity. We've certainly seen some aspects of this happening in the, in the Lake Chad basin, uh, in the area around Lake Chad itself, where there's got some degree of fusion between different uh, ethnic groups working with and for Boko Haram. Um, the, um, the, the, the fusion here, uh, this is from a Boko Haram's arms cache and shows both modern weapons and old flintlocks and dang, cap and ball guns. Um, the, 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 the fusion of past and present, I think, is significant here. We, we know that that's happened at various points in time in other areas of Africa where uh, historically in the, in the colonial period, in the era er of slave raiding, for example, that, uh, that, that these, these periods of great disruption of, of, of the making of refugees, of, of populations fleeing violence, but also populations profiting from violence have led directly to the to the, the formation of new ethnic groups uh, out of fragmented populations. That might well happen in this area as well. I uh, given, the, given the way the Chadian uh, army works, I think it's almost uh, inevitable that it's some ex-members of Boko Haram have served alongside, for example, American and French forces uh, fighting in Mali against uh, Islamist insurgents in Mali. Uh, that I think is, uh, that I think is almost uh, uh, a certainty. Um, one of the things, the last thing I'll say, uh, just to end up, is that there's actually an excellent literature on a whole variety of different aspects of this. Uh, and I think it's, it's fascinating that the area I work in has, uh, has generated this literature on, on various forms of disobedience. Um, and all of these books are, are well worth reading. I, if you want to understand this insurgency, um, uh, I think that you could. There's there's very there's very few uh, books that would better repay reading than uh, Marielle Devos's book, uh, "Living by the Gun in Chad." Uh, how uh, how armed uh, how armed young men primarily navigate their life course from soldiers to insurgents to uh, bandits to customs officials with uh, the, the 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 unifying factor being the métier des armes, the 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 occupation of weapons. And um, uh, so I've been, uh, I've tried to put some historical context into that, into that particular discussion. So um, I'm, I'm going to, I'll stop sharing the screen now. Um, uh, and I'd be, I hope that you found that of some interest and uh, uh, I'd be glad to take any questions that you might have.